I'm going to talk about from offensive insecurity to sustainable security, the role of science and technology. This um, is basically a summary with a few deviations here and there of our report that we've just published called Offensive Insecurity. I'm going to start by running through current security strategies. I, the, the talk is particularly focused on the UK but with a global um, perspective and justify why we use the term offensive insecurity for um, the UK situation and, and it's more broadly applicable to many other countries as well. Then talk about um, progressive security strategies, what's become known as sustainable security. We produced a series of reports starting with soldiers in the laboratory, which many of you will remember, 2005. We've been working on this area, particularly focused work on this area for about 10 years now. Um, and we started off with a, an in-depth report looking at the landscape there soon after the Iraq invasion and, and um, the early years of the war on terror and how that was influencing science and technology and how science and technology was feeding into that. Then did various follow-up briefings focusing on different aspects of the issue. Um, one about alternative careers, one about university involvement, one looking at the corporate sector and also looking at corporate influence more broadly, so the influence of the oil industry and the, uh, the pharmaceutical industry among others. Um, and um, Chris Langley <coughs> was our, our lead that, researcher. That was the sort of first section and then the latest research um, in our latest report which um, we had researcher Barnaby Pace who unfortunately couldn't be here today but he was managed to get a lot more information out of the Ministry of Defence that we previously managed to do particularly using the Freedom of Information Act and, and various requests and that's given us a whole new data to be able to analyse in depth what we couldn't do in the other report and, and um, and focus on the detail. And also by using a lot of civilian um, databases, R&D databases, we've been able to look at um, the spending patterns and, and the focus of research in other areas as well. Um, I'll start with the UK's offensive military capability. These sorts of figures will be no surprise to people. The UK is the fourth largest military spender in the world. Our spending per head of population is about twice that of Russia and about 10 times that of China. So even though in global terms we spend less, per head of population we're much larger. Of course the US is far out in front. Um, we're one of the five declared nuclear weapon states, involvement in major conflicts, um, big arms industry, big arms exporter. And I'll flesh out some of these as we go. The approach to national security is very much focused on involving high-tech, um, what they call network technologies, so a lot of um, the communication systems to enable the coordination of, of different sophisticated weapon systems, and particularly a prominent role for offensive weapon systems. And I'll give you a definition in a, in a second. Military corporations are obviously key to this, and as uh, the sort of privatisation and consolidation of the arms industry after the end of the Cold War has meant you've got a small number of, of private giants which are often monopoly suppliers so that creates problems of sort of economics and, and vested interests involved in the whole system. But underneath all of this uh, scientists and engineers are key. So by offensive capability and, um, and the sort of criteria that we started using to examine in this report the sort of spending that was going on by looking at the military academic literature. There, there were four key areas. One is the destructive capability, so it's the nuclear weapons at the, at the high end of that scale. Then you've got range, and particularly a long range from UK shores, being able to launch ballistic missiles, for example, that have a, a range of, of several thousand miles, launch fighter jets, which with refueling also have a range of several thousand miles and, and can um, carry out ground strikes bombing raids at a considerable distance. Mobility is more related to deploying forces a long way and that's a particular example there is the aircraft carriers um, that the UK has and is building um, and also in general the, a, the ability to deploy 
um, troops and military systems a long way from home. So transport systems um, are also key within this offensive capability. <coughs> um, so long range um, transport aircraft part of it. And the, the terminology that UK policy documents in this area, such as the National Security Strategy and the Strategic Defence and Security Review use is force projection. And that's what you will see and that is very much about a sort of aggressive military capability. So the key systems, nuclear weapons, which I am I'm sure are familiar to many of you. Phil will talk in more depth about the work we've been doing on this issue, um, particularly, but the current force is, is four submarines, 180 warheads, um, and each submarine capable of deploying four million tons of the explosive power of four million tons, which is a vast amount. Um, the future plans are, with well, the final decision in 2016 is about more of the same, maybe a reduction in one submarine, that's the current plan. Um, the costs, as you'll see, are enormous as well. Um, as well as nuclear weapons, the less talked about or less controversial and, and certainly within mainstream media discussions are things like the aircraft carriers, the long range strike aircraft. We have two aircraft carriers, Queen Elizabeth class that are being built at the moment. At the moment the UK is just on the verge of retiring its last um, of the previous generation of, of um, aircraft carriers, the Invincible class as they're called. Um, and then we will have a period with no aircraft carriers at all, but the idea is that we'll be back with a vengeance towards the end of this decade, and we will have the biggest aircraft carriers that the Royal Navy has ever seen. Each one of these aircraft carriers will be three times as big as the previous class. Um, they won't have any jets on them when they're first um, deployed because they won't be ready. Um, but a few years later, they will have some long-range strike planes, the F-35s or Lightning IIs. So, two are being built. You've seen, probably seen the news that the costs of these systems have doubled over the time that they've been building them. Um, the second carrier, at the moment, the plans are to just put it into storage because we can't afford to run that one as well, or maybe sell it. It's kind of, this, this is sort of the kind of thing that you see that there's a real aspiration within UK military to have a very powerful world-class military, but we can't really afford it, even though we're spending vast amounts of money. So, in terms of the strike planes, we've got the Tornadoes, which are the generation that is about to be retired. The Typhoons used to be known as the Eurofighter. We've got about a hundred of those deployed now. They've been modified. They were originally developed during the Cold War to defend us in dogfights against Russian MiGs. They've been modified now because that's not so relevant. Um, they've been modified now to be able to carry out ground strikes. So long distance bombing rates. Um, the next generation, what's called fifth generation fighters, is the F-35 or Lightning II or Joint Strike Fighter or Joint Combat Aircraft. It's had so many names it's easy to get mixed up. So these are things with thousands of miles of um, range, particularly with air-to-air air -air refueling, so that they can carry out long-range um, bombing raids. And the typhoons were used in particular, for example, in um, um, the war in Libya. Other systems, we've got what are, what are known as hunter-killer submarines. The new generation is, is Stute class. We have two of them deployed already five more under construction or about to be commissioned. These have a range that is only limited by the amount of food they can carry for the crew. They're run by a nuclear reactor, um, don't need refueling or refueling um, every few <coughs> years. And they carry Tomahawk cruise missiles so that they can be deployed offshore somewhere, fire these missiles deep in land, and, and again, they have a very powerful um, defensive capability and were also used in Libya. The one that's making the use most at the moment is the armed drones. The UK deploys a small number at the moment of US-made Reaper drones. The um, plans are to expand these and also um, develop new UK-made ones. BAE Systems is, is heavily involved in that, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Then you've got a number of other aircraft, warships, 
the new generation of TAC helicopters called the Future Lynx or Wildcat is um, starting to be deployed. Um, you've got the Type 45 destroyers, Type 26 global combat ship, which is um, under design. The budget for all these things is about 160 billion. This is the go what the government estimates on its defence equipment plan, which was launched earlier this year. So 160 billion pounds over the next year, 10 years to maintain or bring these weapons into service. This is an increase over what is currently spent, or what has been spent over recent years, against the background of government cuts mm. within the MOD, cuts in the army, cuts within the civil service in the MOD, and of course across government as well. This is a breakdown of, <coughs> I don't know whether you can read all these, but um, you can see this is how the 160 billion is broken down. So right at the top, you've got submarines and nuclear weapons, making sure the big weapons are up the top. They 35.8 billion is planned to be spent over the next 10 years. Replace Trident, or at least the first stage of replacing Trident, and um, the rest of the astute class submarines. And you've got all the um, um, Lightning Twos and Typhoons, the rest of the fleet of those, and um, drones, both armed and surveillance drones. 18.5 billion there. You've got the completion of the two aircraft carriers, plus the destroyers and, and global combat ship. Um, then the smaller systems go down steadily and have got about eight billion pounds of contingency funds, which probably won't be enough, mm -hmm. given the um, problems they've had with overspend. And that, as I say, exemplified by the aircraft carrier doubling its budget over the time they've been building it and it's still not finished. Within this budget, we've got a spending level on research and development of about £1.8 billion pounds per year. This is about one-sixth of UK government spending. It's one of the highest levels in the world. Some of this money is spent by government within its own research labs at the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. Most of it is spent within industry, particularly BAE Systems, or Rolls-Royce Kinetic, big arms companies, um, and then a bit in universities as well. Here's the data that we got out of the Ministry of Defence using the Freedom of Information Act. So this is a breakdown. These are the top six programmes, spending over three years. And um, these are minimum values because they wouldn't give us all the data or they couldn't give us all the data. So um, it's probably a few tens of millions higher in each category, but not more. And see, top of the list is the strike aircraft. Typhoon, lightning, even a bit on, on tornado. Um, then you've got the attack helicopters, particularly the future links. Submarines and nuclear weapons. So you've got all, all the funding for R&D on conventionally armed and nuclear armed submarines. They, they didn't um, give us a breakdown of which was which. So um, that was lumped together there. But they did give us a breakdown for the propulsion system, which is the new New, new design of nuclear reactor that will propel the new nuclear armed submarines. Um, then you've got the nuclear weapons themselves, mainly the warheads, um, so that's work at AWE, the uh, order master, and drones, particularly mm. armed drones at the bottom there. So again, the strong emphasis on offensive systems, and we tried to, we made an attempt to classify according to the um, military academic literature about which had a, a key role in offensive weapon systems or in offensive um, force projection and we reckoned it was about three quarters of the funding um, about 12 percent was much more uh, that, that could only really be used for homeland defense and then another 12 percent was, was about sort of support um, military technologies and military equipment which is much, which could be used um, in either of offense or defense and that's from a total budget over the three years of about five five point four billion flesh out a little bit more about two of, of the particular weapon systems one is nuclear warheads there's been a massive expansion of atomic weapons establishment over the last um, last few years um, new supercomputers, new laser system, new hydrogeodynamics lab for examining um, nuclear explosions in depth, simulating nuclear explosions, joint work with the USA and France, a new joint um, 
starting to build a new joint research centre with France and there's a lot of concern that this is breaching the international treaties, particularly the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty and the um, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the other one that's in the news is, is armed drones in the UK. Um, the first armed drones deployed in 2007, we've had, the, according to the available data, at least 350 drone strikes have been carried out in Afghanistan by um, UK. Within the R&D, you've got work with Israeli arms companies because Israel is a, is a major leader in arms and drones technology. Most of that work tends to be on surveillance work, but it, it dips over into the arms side as well. There are two systems that BAE systems have been developing, one called the Mantis, which is this plane here, which is very similar to the Reaper that's being deployed already, uh, the US built one. Then you've got the Tyrannus, which is this long-range supersonic, which employs stealth technology to avoid radar, so it's very much at the far end of the offensive weapon systems. And universities involved not in the classified work, but in a lot of the work that helps build up the knowledge level and, and, um, and the um, early sort of development of systems and, and aerodynamics. And obviously there are a lot of concerns about this, particularly around civilian casualties, the, um, there was a study just published based on classified military data in the US that estimated that the number of civilian casualties in drone strikes was about 10 times the number of civilian casualties in um, strikes by manned aircraft. So, so the universities are involved and, and some of our previous work has shown the extent of, of UK university involvement. And we estimated it was about 200 million pounds a year the official figures are rather lower. It's very hard to be sure on this because of um, because actually using the Freedom of Information Act to get data out of universities is extraordinarily hard. Um, in fact, I think we got better data out of the MOD. There are various schemes that fund this. Some are purely orientated through the, uh, run through the government. Some are run through corporate, and then there are joint schemes. The Defence Technology Centre are the, the most active and most successful. To end this little bit, this is an international comparison of military R&D spending, um, looking at both the proportion out of total public spending on R&D and also the, the actual amount. And you can see it as a proportion. The US is far out in front, um, but the UK is kind of leader of the following pack. And um, although this budget has been compressed in recent years, um, it's very much government policy and uh, being pushed by everyone from the Defence Select Committee to the arms industry pushing for this to be raised. The first bit of bad news. <laughs> Next bit of bad news is around what this means in terms of both insecurity and, and how unsustainable development feeds into this as well. These sorts of figures I think are are well known as civilian casualties in the wars that the UK has been involved with. Um, there's the estimate for violent deaths in Iraq, the estimates for um, indirect deaths related to um, things like breakdown of healthcare within Iraq and, and things like depleted uranium and a number of other issues, the estimates are much higher. Um, but you've also got um, the fueling um, terrorism and being used um, by terrorist groups um, as justification for attacks on the UK. And I've got a quote, or at least a, a, an excerpt from the MI5, uh, former MI5 chief, Eliza Manning Buller, who, who went on record at the Chilcot inquiry on the Iraq war, saying the invasion of Iraq substantially increased the terrorist threat to the UK. So it's not just um, these peaceniks are claiming this. It's very much from um, the centre of the security, uh, security establishment. But the, the arms export side of things, there are figures from the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute that estimate that the UK's sixth largest arms exporter, but that the arms exports are shrinking, whereas the UK government figures are that the arms exports are increasing, and it's hard to... Um, figure out what's exactly going on. What, what is very clear is that we 
export to a whole range of um, authoritarian regimes. Um, I've listed the ones that are involved in the Arab Spring here, the, the governments that suppressed various um, democratic uprisings. Um, and particularly the number here, 119 million euros um, for the export licenses to Libya under Gaddafi during the um, four years before um, who violently suppressed the, the protests in, in Libya. So, um, fueling insecurity that way. And, and the latest example, just um, in September, um, Britain holding one of the world's largest arms fairs, the um, Dizzy or Defence and Security Equipment International Fair, which had, um, we will ask Anne if she can <coughs> remember how many how many um, authoritarian regimes are invited to this one? Yeah, yeah. Mm. it's a few dozen, yeah. Um, moving on to the unsustainability side of things and how this feeds into the security argument, I wanted to highlight some climate change issues. The official good news is this figure here. The UK greenhouse gas emissions measured <coughs> domestically are about 26% down on 1990 levels, which looks pretty good. Um, on closer analysis and, and work that's been recently completed by the Committee on Climate Change, which looks at what happens when you take into account the embodied carbon dioxide emissions from imported, that are imported minus those that are exported, and it reckons that they're about 80% higher. So, um, so you've got the official level per head of population nine, which is a bit lower than, than the EU average, a lot lower than the US and, and Canadian average, for example, but once you include the exported, uh, the imported emissions, or net imported emissions, the carbon footprints are much higher. And if you compare it to estimates of what might be a sustainable level, um, we're clearly well outside, eight times bigger than a sustainable level, a long way to go. While this figure, the domestic level, is falling, at the moment the total carbon footprint is still rising. And climate change feeds into conflict in a number of ways, um, particularly pressure on various resources through water, through causing more droughts and, and sea level rise, causing um, salt water to inundate freshwater aquifers and so reducing water supply, um, affects crop yields, fisheries, ecosystems, which all are essential sources of food, then you've got things like flood risk, storm risk, and uh, what we've seen in the Philippines particularly, and how that affects um, <coughs> people's ability to live a reasonable quality of life. The estimates, there are a range of estimates around the number of refugees in, caused by environmental issues, but um, one of the recent estimates is 150 million um, by the middle of the century. Um, and all these things can feed into conflict, which the UK government acknowledges. Within that is the UK's use of fossil fuels. It's the main source of carbon emissions. Um, it's also the main way that we produce and use energy. A few figures, it's like nearly 90% of all the energy used in the UK is from fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas. Um, the industry is very powerful, as no doubt you are aware. Um, estimates of fossil fuel subsidies, um, there's a range of these, but again, the, uh, a recently published um, um, sort of review of the literature estimated that they're over four billion pounds a year uh, in various <laughs> fossil fuel subsidies in the UK. Um, and this is again about Britain importing more of its energy than it used to, <coughs> importing coal, importing oil, and government approach to this is let's explore for more gas and do more fracking in the UK <coughs> rather than diversifying to renewables. Um, and then there's the whole nuclear issue. Um, but obviously, particularly with importing energy sources from unstable, unstable parts of the world, that very much feeds into the um, insecurity. In terms of broader environmental impacts, there's an awful lot that could be said give you a quick summary which is about the ecological footprint which takes into account a wide range of issues. Um, the current estimate for Britain's consumption level of total resources and its impact on the earth is that we need 
if the world consumed as as the UK consumed, we'd need about 2.65 planet Earths to feed us. So again, far away. And another issue that we talk about a bit in the report is the whole economic injustice issue and how that can feed into conflict. Still, huge numbers in extreme poverty. The the inequality is massive, and the trade rules, for example, are are very unfair. And the UK financial sector is. is very influential in continuing this system. In terms of research and development which feeds this, the example I want to give you here is, is again related to the fossil fuel industry. Um, there's incomplete figures particularly on industry involvement, but um, the good news is the public spending is rather less than it used to be in, in years gone by. Um, it's about 20 million per year at the moment. The bad news is it's starting to increase again particularly tied to things like unconventional fossil fuels or um, shale gas and, and tar sands. There's a lot of money being put in by the oil industries um, and some of that is directly going into UK universities. There was a report just published by um, People and Planet and various other um, NGOs um, trying to estimate that sort of level and it's around tens of billions of pounds per year of direct fossil fuel industry involvement good bit of news is that research councils are only funding fossil fuel R&D that's directly related to carbon capture and storage, so taking the emission, trapping the emissions rather than um, just conventional fossil fuel research. One step in the right direction. The last slide that I will um, show here is a quick summary of where public spending is. These are government figures on spending by end use. So you've got the advancement of knowledge here, which is mainly the research council spending. Um, military is third here. That's only in the last year or two um, has it been overtaken by health. It used to be the largest single area, apart from advancement of knowledge. Um, and you've got important areas like environment, energy, agriculture, or substantially less. Even when you take money within programs at the research councils um, that are directed, at least partly applied to these ends, even if you reallocate those in that figure, it's still, the military funding still comes out much larger. So, let's start talking about <laughs> where we can go and, and a few bits of good news about pointing how fast we're moving in this direction. The first thing is about this concept of sustainable security, which was um, coined by some researchers at, at the Oxford Research Group, which is a security think tank. Um, a few years ago, they published a report on this issue, and it's been quite influential, and, and we've used it in our work and, and have used it in our report as well to help us more clearly critique the issue. So there are four areas that they argue are a subject of insecurity and are of growing importance because of the prevailing sort of social, economic, environmental trends. The first is competition over resources. That's everything from water to oil and various minerals, land issues, some of the things that I've talked about briefly already. Global militarization, particularly driven by the arms trade, the international arms trade, both illegal and illegal. Uh, and legal. What they call marginalization of the majority world, which is both it's both the massive inequality and, and poverty, but also with the advent of new communication systems, the ability of poor people to see how rich everybody else is, or at least not everybody else, the small rich, the group of rich people in northern countries, and that as being a, a source of, dis, um, of unrest and, and um, resentment. And then behind all this is the growing problem of climate change, sort of amplifying these other threats. One bit of good news was that in the UK national security strategy, which came out in 2010, the government recognised that it's not just UK security is not just about mil the military and defending against invading armies. In fact, they kind of recognised that actually we had no real threats. They still think that we need a big army with uh, or big armed forces with major force projection abilities, but there was clear acceptance and, and um, some 
acknowledgement of the importance of, of spending money on tackling environmental research problems and putting money into international development to help stabilize the international situation. With one step towards um, sustainable security, and particularly tackling the, the, the offensive nature of the UK military system, is this concept called non-offensive defence. And it, it got a lot of attention towards the end of the Cold War, and unfortunately hasn't had much attention since. The important step recognising that there are particular weapon systems that threaten other countries, but also amplify arms races and can lead and can increase the risk of, of conflict. So if countries stop it deploying these or at least reduce the numbers, they can that can play a critical part in, in uh, moving towards a more peaceful society. And they particularly identify things like weapons of mass destruction, so nuclear weapons, aircraft carriers, and, and the various long range warships, long range strike aircraft and ballistic missiles in particular, and the role of the arms, export industry and um, shrinking the military industry in general, but still retaining, retaining some ability to deploy keep peacekeeping forces. And there is possible benefits. I think <coughs> Phil is going to say a bit more about some of these ideas in his talk about if we move to a more, a less aggressive military policy and focus more on arms control and disarmament efforts and show by example that we could help galvanize effort on a new treaty to ban nuclear weapons, make the new arms trade treaty much uh, much stronger and, and much more effective. It would save a lot of money, somewhere in the region of, we estimate something like six or eight billion pounds a year that could be used in all sorts of other ways. One area where the government does recognize um, that it should be putting money, and one of the things that I do compliment David Cameron about is that we have retained the aid budget against many cuts elsewhere and it's still growing. And the attempt is to hit the international target of 0.7% um, GDP, um, which was agreed back in the 70s, I think. It isn't always well targeted, but um, there are a lot of good projects that are going on um, to help improve security in post-conflict situations, improve health, education, tackle climate change um, and poverty. But then there's a kind of blind spot around the unfair trade issue and injustices of the wider economic system. Within um, the UK, the sustainable energy side of things, there's um, a few bits of good news. One is that home insulation has increased substantially over the last five years. It's not gone anywhere near as far as it needs to, but for example, um, loft insulation, number of houses with loft insulation has gone up by 60% over the last five years, number of houses with cavity wall insulation has gone up over 30%. So some of the schemes that are out there, but um, a lot of fears about the new schemes that are coming in are, are failing, um, which is a step backwards. Um, the amount of renewable energy deployed is much higher, three and a half times the level it was in 2000. But it's taken a lot of effort to get there, and of course the government is now starting to row back on some of the areas. Britain is still a world leader in offshore wind deployment, deploying more um, more offshore wind capacity than any other country at the moment. It will probably get overtaken soon if it doesn't keep up with the effort. Um, we will see, and there are reforms of all the subsidies underway. In our report, we we tried to bring all the research and development around these issues tried to come up with some sort of estimate of what R&D contributes to sustainable su security, so contributing to the driver, uh, tackling the drivers of, of conflict in four areas that we talked about, climate change, competition over resources, um, global militarism and marginalisation of, of um, the majority world. And um, we looked across a range of departments and research councils and estimated that there was probably nearly a billion pounds per year being spent. Some of it directly um, by government departments. The figure for a department for international development is quite high, for example. There are much smaller numbers around energy, climate change, environment. Um, there's some, a lot of spending on environmental issues within the research councils. Um, uh, transfer to policy is, is not so good. To summarise and, and bring sort of all these issues and, and numbers together, 
this is a graph that we we estimated in the report. So you've got this is the military spending per year, um, 1.8 billion, <coughs> three quarters of it on offensive weapon systems development, sustainable security work. You've got a bit of government funded work there, mainly around um, international development, but it's the military spending is around seven times the government spending. You've got some good R research council funded work there, but it's not strongly linked to policy. So um, there's a lot that could be changed and simply shrinking this and growing this. Um, it's a more complicated than that, but that's the sort of perspective that we're arguing. Um, and new priorities should be things like arms control and disarmament, there's, there's work there, very valuable work that the government is doing in that area. We need a lot more of it. Much more priority to environmental problems, reducing resource use and, and tackling climate change, and, and recognizing more economic reform as, as a priority, and, and understanding that we need R&D to help us understand the problems better so that we can um, propose solutions. And then, of course, there's issues like renewable energy and, and efficiency. <laughs> so, just to finish, sort of changing the direction for the UK, key areas are cutting offensive weapon systems and fossil fuel subsidies, give you something like 10 or 12 billion pounds per year to play with, um, and various areas that could help, um, would help um, produce better security internationally. And, um, and that's what we really need, and we really need it urgently. That's everything. Um, there's references here. I'll put this web uh, this talk on our website so you can have a look at it more. Thank you.